This is A Word, a podcast from Slate. I'm your host, Jason Johnson. The historic black town of Eatonville, Florida, was celebrated in the work of legendary author Zora Neale Hurston. But historic disenfranchisement and pressure from developers have been threatening the community for decades. Could surviving this latest crisis finally put Eatonville back on the map? Most times, developers come in already with this plan of what this community needs, but they never truly ask the community, what do you need and how can we help you? Saving Historic Eatonville, coming up on A Word with me, Jason Johnson. Stay with us. Hey there, A Word listeners. Before we get started, I want to let you know about a story coming up a little bit later in the show. It's from our partners at Macy's. Since 2022, Macy's has partnered with Trust for Public Land, whose mission is to give everyone access to wide open space by revamping urban schoolyards, trails, and parks. From April 1st to the 30th, you can support Trust for Public Land's Community Schoolyards project by rounding up your Macy's in-store purchase or donating online. Stick around to hear from Danielle from Trust for Public Land. Welcome to A Word, a podcast about race and politics and everything else. I'm your host, Jason Johnson. In the years after the Civil War, dozens of small communities were founded by formerly enslaved people. Only a handful of those towns survive, and Eatonville, Florida, was one of the first and perhaps the most famous. Known as the town that freedom built, Eatonville was immortalized in the stories of Native daughter, author Zora Neale Hurston in the novel Their Eyes Were Watching God, and in her other writing. While the community lives on in her words... In real life, Eatonville, Florida is struggling. The town population is just above 2,000 people, and the remaining land is under threat from developers. Although the latest land grab has fizzled, local activists are looking for ways to revitalize Eatonville and preserve it as a historical site and haven for black families. Joining us to talk about Eatonville is Aaliyah Wright. She's a journalist with Capital B, a nonprofit news source for African Americans, and she has been reporting on this story. Aaliyah Wright, welcome to A Word. Thanks for having me. In order for this story to make sense, we need to talk a bit about its history. For those who are unfamiliar with Eatonville, briefly tell us about when and why this town was founded. Yeah. um, So after the Civil War, a lot of formerly enslaved folks were trying to escape, you know, racial oppression, wanting to advance economically, self-govern themselves. And so Edenville was one of the towns that sprung up. What's interesting is that Joe Clark, who was a formerly enslaved person, met with a white philanthropist from the North, um, Louis Lawrence, who then convinced a white landowner, um, Josiah Eden, to sell 112 acres to create the town of Edenville. And so after that, in 1887, the town was incorporated by 27 Black men. And the condition was that the land could only be sold to what, you know, they call colored or, you know, Black folks. And so that's how um, the town of Edenville was established. At its height, we know most about Edenville because of the writings of Zora Neale Hurston. But here's the thing. There's a lot of Americans who don't know that much about Zora Neale Hurston. (laughs) What makes her so significant and what role does sort of Zora Neale Hurston play in sort of the tapestry of American literature, American history and specifically African-American history? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I didn't learn um, or the first time I had heard about Zora Neale Hurston was possibly senior year of high school when my English teacher introduced their eyes were watching God. And I think even at that time, I didn't understand the magnitude of what her writing meant, you know, in the early what 1900s. And so speaking to Edenville, she really illustrated, you know, the significance and importance of the town through her writings. But even during the time um, when she was alive, people didn't understand how great her literature was. And it wasn't until what after her death that, you know, Alice Walker reintroduced her work to the world and people started to learn more about, you know, Zora Neale Hurston. So I think a lot of people didn't know about her, you know, during the time, but people began to start learning more about her after her death, which is, you know, unfortunate, but a great thing that we all know today. You've had conversations with people in Eatonville. You've talked to young people. You've talked to older people. What's the most surprising thing you've heard from someone about either the town of Eatonville or the current struggle? What's the thing that made you say, oh, my God, I got to make sure that I have this in my story? 
I think usually when we think of the modern day improvements to a town, you see the high rise buildings, apartments are starting to look more like hotels, all of these things that show the newness of a place. But I think the pride of how their town looks now is what they want the town to look like and be and feel. It's like historic wooden frame homes. Um, you know, it doesn't have, you know, five lane, four lane highway, you know, all of these things, when you think of a city, they really take pride that their town is a town. Like, despite the ongoing, you know, progression of, you know, cities, they don't want that. Like, yes, they want to, again, have the essential and necessary things to live, but they love the fact that their town still, you know, resembles a lot of the history, the architecture that has been there for years. And I think that's what stood out to me and and speaks to a lot of rural places. Although we know they're not monolithic, of course, but I'm from a rural town in Mississippi. That spoke to me because I'm like, oh, yeah, my town has some similarities like that, too. Like, We want newer things, but we also want to keep, you know, again, that historic architecture that when you come in, you know, it's unique. You know, it's Eatonville. Millard Levette is one of the town elders, a community advocate, and he teaches Sunday school at a local church. And he said that he wants the town to be exactly as it is, old Eatonville, not new Eatonville. So I think that's one of the things that really resonated with me and just really speaks to, you know, just the feel, the spirit of a small historic black town. We're going to take a short break and we come back more on saving the historically black community of Eatonville, Florida. This is A Word with Jason Johnson. Stay tuned. This podcast is brought to you by Slate Studios and Macy's. Hey, y'all, what's up? It's your girl, Lene Vanee. I'm a writer, creator, and a change maker. And there's nothing like a powerful statistic to spur me into action. Did you know that one in three U.S. residents, including 28 million children, do not have a park or green space within a 10-minute walk of their home? Well, Macy's and Trust for Public Land are on a mission to change that. They're finding ways to connect everyone to the outdoors. It's Danielle's mission, too. I'm Danielle Dang, National Schoolyard Initiative Director at Trust for Public Land. We've been transforming empty and uninviting schoolyards into thriving learning environments that double as a park after hours. When you create a schoolyard and open it to the community, it welcomes the entire community into that school. It nurtures a much stronger connection. We work directly with the students to design their schoolyard. The students are the designers. They begin to think like landscape architects, civil engineers, architects, planners, and they see themselves as agents of change. We are thrilled to partner with Macy's. Their support of our work has helped us to strengthen existing schoolyard programs and help to start new programs. Now's the time to help communities create parks where they're needed most. This April, when you round up your purchase at Macy's or donate online, You'll help fund Trust for Public Land's Community Schoolyard Initiative. Find out how Macy's is creating brighter futures for all at macy's.com slash purpose. This is Jason Johnson, host of A Word, Slate's podcast about race and politics and everything else. I want to take a moment to welcome our new listeners. If you've discovered A Word and like what you hear, please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. And let us know what you think by writing us at a word at slate.com. Thank you. You're listening to A Word with Jason Johnson. Today we're talking about preserving the historic black community of Eatonville, Florida, with Capital B reporter Aaliyah Wright. So there's what used to be like a 300 acre plot of land in Eatonville that used to be the home of black community schools. What are black community schools and how is it this land went from black ownership and control into sort of white government officials? Yes. So, you know, before desegregation, black students needed a place um, to, you know, learn to educate themselves. And so this is how black community schools pop up all across the country in these historic black towns. 
And so in the late 1890s, there were philanthropists that donated land to the town of Edenville in order to build an all-Black private boarding school called the Robert Hungerford Preparatory High School. The name has changed since then. And so after that time in the 1950s, there were trustees who um, oversaw that land. And so even before the Orange County Public Schools took ownership of um, the property where the school was, the trustees had tried to sell the land to a church, but that failed. And so then their next attempt was to get the Orange County Public School District to take ownership of the school property. And so what's interesting is that those trustees were all court appointed trustees. And there were seven of them, six of whom which were white. So during this time when they were trying to get Orange County public schools to take over the land, there was a contest to the sale of that land by Robert Hungerford's daughter, um, which made its way all the way to the Florida State Supreme Court. She was contesting that selling this land would go against the original purpose of the trust, which was if they were to acquire this land it must be used to educate Black children, right? And so when it got to the Supreme Court um, in 1952, a judge basically said the school could no longer exist because of the decline of Black students and the lack of funding that was necessary to keep the school open. What was interesting is a plan was presented not only by Hungerford's daughter, but along with Mary McLeod Bethune to say, hey, here's a plan to keep this, you know, school open specifically for black children. That plan, as we know, was disregarded. And the court moved forward to allow the Orange County Public School Districts to buy 300 acres for only $16,000. So again, it was still under the condition that if they got this land, it had to be used to educate the black children. And so that's how Orange County was able to buy the property for a super, you know, low amount and take over the school. You know, the most recent threat to the survival of Eatonville was a potential sale of 100 acres of that land uh, to a developer for approximately $14 million, which I'm sure uh, is lower than what the value of the property is, given it's Florida and the story you just shared with us. Um, How did that deal get so far? And what do we know about why that deal fell through? You know, it's interesting because... In 2022, so, you know, earlier I mentioned this education restriction, right, on the land. The Orange County Public Schools was able to dissolve that restriction in 2022. And so because of that, that's when they started to pursue sale on this last remaining 100 acres of land. It wasn't until last spring when residents started to find out about the potential sale. And it was only because one of the residents had went to a zoning and planning meeting when they heard the developers pitching this plan to the council. At that particular time, according to the citizen, the council didn't um, read through the plan and they were like, yes, let's go for it. And that raised red flags. So the community immediately started to rally around each other, um, have, you know, educational meetings, you know, go to the town halls. And when the um, plan was presented to the Edenville Town Council last September, three of the five council members voted in favor of amending the zoning area so that the developers could move forward with their plan. So that would just make it easier for them to build. Now, again, community was like, no, we're not going for this. And they began flooding meetings, calling their town council members, telling them to do their due diligence on this plan because they felt the land would not only eradicate their history because of what Pongerford property stood for, but it would also price out residents because this proposed development would not only construct office spaces, it would also build residential houses between, you know, a price tag of $400,000 to $600,000, way above what residents could afford in the area. And so at that point, um, we get to this year in February. By this time, the town council, all but one member voted against the zoning plan that the developers um, had pitched to them. And so that was, you know, sort of like a win to the community because they felt that their town council members were listening to them and this would halt the process. But we know that Orange County could still pursue the sale of the land despite the town council from approving that zoning. 
you know, once the plan, the sale of the land moves forward, they would have to work out some things to make sure they are in alignment with the town council, but it still would not stop the sale. One of the things that's key that I want to ask you is, you know, Capital B has been paying attention to this. Um, you guys brought national attention to it. other people to sort of cover this issue. Do you think that has played a role in the community being able to push back against the development ideas? Because, you know, we, we've seen examples of this in Bruce's Beach. We've seen examples of these sort of long term property battles that that African-American communities have had or African-American families have had. And they've been fighting for years. But when it got national attention, they sort of had the wind at their backs to fight back. Yes. And that's something that I heard specifically from, you know, folks I spoke with on the ground that they were appreciative of local coverage, local, you know, news outlets um, covering this issue and sharing their stories. But they were really grateful that um, the story made national news outlets and people like Capital B were able to cover the story and give more momentum. Um, and, And one of the things that, you know, one of the residents said to me is that, this shows them that we're serious. People care about what's happening in Edenville and understand the magnitude of what this could mean. For your article, you spoke with Julian Johnson, a young black activist and Edenville native. Uh, he was also interviewed by CBS Sunday Morning. Here's some of what he had to say. Edenville is a walking museum. It's a walking national monument. The entire town. So being from this town and looking at it from outside in, it's like gold, like we're walking on on gold and people just don't understand because they're caught up what it currently looks like. That's all they're caught up in instead of what it can be. I always think this is important because it's one thing to have national people pay attention. It's one thing to have national organizations pay attention. But this guy's from there, right? Like <laughs> This is his home. And Johns is one of the voice calling for this land to somehow be restored to the control of the residents of Eatonville. How would that work? What would that even look like? Would it be that the land can't be sold or developed until all 2000 voting age residents agree to it? How would that actually work to restore this land to the people who live there for generations? One, they're still working out what that would look like. But one of the things that they did mention is creating a trust that the community can oversee similar to you know how the land was given when it was established um they had a trust at that point to oversee the land and so i think they want to go back to that model but ensure that folks who are doing the work are a part of that trust and able to make the decisions on behalf of the land We're going to take a short break. We come back more about the way forward for the historically black town of Eatonville, Florida. This is a word with Jason Johnson. Stay tuned. You're listening to a word with Jason Johnson. Today, we're talking with journalist Aaliyah Wright about preserving Eatonville, Florida. Eatonville Mayor Angie Gardner has said that she's not opposed to all development. Here's a clip of her speaking to local station W.E.S.H. We say that we want development and I'm for development as long as it's right for the people. So, Aliyah, here's what's interesting. Whenever I hear politicians say I'm OK with some development if it's the right kind, I always question if that's really a reflection of what the community wants. So when you've talked to people in Eatonville what do they want development to look like? What's the development that they desire? And is it in any way in conflict with what the mayor seems to want? First off, I want to say that the mayor has been in conversation with the community. She's partnered with the Association to Preserve Eatonville, which is a nonprofit organization that does a lot of cultural tourism in the town. So she's partnered with them to hold informational meetings about what's been happening. You know, what do they want to see? She's also been, again, a staunch opponent. When I spoke to her specifically, she said that the development had too much residential. Again, I mentioned earlier, you know, 
these homes would price out residents who are already there. And when I spoke with, you know, some of the residents, including Julian Johnson, they spoke about wanting this to be a cultural oasis, a museum, having a, you know, culture and art center, um, wanting to have an amphitheater, bringing in talents from all across, you know, the country to come and perform. They wouldn't have to go to Orlando or other communities to view or engage in these activities. A grocery store, you know, things to really improve their quality of life. And I think one of the important things that they express to me is most times developers come in already with this plan of what this community needs, but they never truly ask the community, what do you need and how can we help you? And I think that's part, you know, of the reason why they've been opposed to it. No one has asked them what they want. They're just, you know, wanting to create or build or construct these things um, without the community in mind. There used to be an event here called Zora Fest. And I, and I want to make this clear about why this is important in case you, you don't really know that much about Zora Neale Hurston's for the audience. We don't actually have a lot of sort of historians and cultural critics at the time who can tell us what day-to-day black life was like at the early part of the 20th century. So Zora Neale Hurston is extremely important for American history, American culture, women's history, African-American culture. This was a festival that used to go on every year in Eatonville that has sort of been slowed down, you know, by the pandemic. Zora Fest has come back. In the eyes of the residents, was it successful? And and were they able to sort of connect the festival to their ongoing struggle to preserve the identity and importance of this historic town? I think, you know, in talking with N. Wyna Theory, who helps put on that festival, you know, year after year, it has been, you know, her duty in the midst of this fight to push on and let people know about this festival for folks who, you know, have never even stepped foot in Edenville, who may have, you know, learned about Zora Neale Hurston, but weren't really familiar with her work and allow people to really explore the history beyond Zora of Eatonville. What I talked to NY, she just mentioned how they want to continue to make it bigger and better. And, you know, even with talking with her about what's going on with the land, she was still, you know, promoting the Zora Fest. She's like, we have been doing we have been preserving our community for a long time. We have been telling this history for a long time. We have been bringing folks all across the world through this festival. And we're going to continue, you know, to do that and make that happen despite, you know, the ongoing battles for the land. But I think it has only, in her words, brought more attention and eyes to the work that they have already been doing. So here's what's interesting. You know, we all have been following the fact that, you know, uh, Republican Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, you know, he has a Stop Woke Act. Um, he's been trying to, you know, sort of have these racist rewrites of history. And literally, the plight and existence of a town like Eatonville is the antithesis of what DeSantis wants, right? They, they want this kind of history to be erased. Do Eatonville residents see themselves as preserving this land and preserving Eatonville and this history sort of for their own families? Or do they also sort of wrap it into this overall battle against authoritarianism and this sort of 1984-esque rewriting of history that Ron DeSantis is trying to pull off? With talking, you know, to residents, my takeaway has been this is not just Edenville history. This is American history. Their fight to ensure that this history is told speaks to the spirit of our ancestors in their fight to do the same thing. And so I also believe that with this story um, making national news, it's reminiscent of that too. It shows just how a community will fight continuously, tirelessly to ensure that folks in power will not continue to not only diminish their history, but they can expose what the true history is through the acts of those folks. You know, I always like to end the program on either a helpful note or a call to action or something that people can do. What can people around the country do? 
are there places they can donate? Can they call state officials? Is there a county board that they could call into or send emails? How can people around the country participate in preserving this history? Before you know, I answer that question, I do want to say that the residents did, you know, pat themselves on the back and congratulate themselves in stopping the sale because we know the Orange County Public Schools was supposed to go forward with the sale on March 31st. The Southern Poverty Law Center filed a lawsuit on March 24th to, you know, block that sale. Days after that lawsuit was filed, the developer basically backed out of the deal and it fell through. So Orange County Public School District has released a statement basically saying they won't pursue any bids on the land. You know, they want to work with the community of Eatonville to figure out what to do with the land. You know, in light of that recent news, residents have told me, one, they're skeptical about Orange County wanting to work with them, given the history and the relationship that they have with them. But, you know, they are on the ground ensuring that communities, their community is informed about, you know, affordable housing, about land development, about entrepreneurship, so that when folks out, you know, outside of Edenville do want to pour in, you know, monetary resources, they're organized and they know where and what to do next. There are, you know, organizations I mentioned, the Association to Preserve the Community of Edenville, um, Land Back 1887, you know, who are, who have websites can donate to those organizations. They have, you know, merchandise to support their efforts. They have the Zora Fest, you know, as we've talked about. But I think those are, you know, some of the things to, you know, just continue to pour into those one organization so that they can keep doing the work. And then, you know, just speaking directly to them about what are the things that they need in the near future. Aaliyah Wright is a reporter with the nonprofit news site Capital B. Thanks so much for joining us today on A Word. Thanks for having me. And that's A Word for this week. The show's email is a word at slate.com. This episode was produced by Christy Taiwo Macanjula. Ben Richmond is Slate's Senior Director of Podcast Operations. Alicia Montgomery is the Vice President of Slate Audio. Our theme music was produced by Don Will. I'm Jason Johnson. Tune in next week for Word. Word.